Marjorie Mead, um, Interim Director of the Wade Center, and it's just a joy to have all of you here tonight. And this is just a really special evening. We um, have two wonderful speakers uh, who have given a joint lecture here before on the book that they wrote together, um, The Surprising Imagination of C.S. Lewis. And if you were here that night, you'll know how wonderful it is to have the two of them partnering on things. But um, let me just take a moment to introduce uh, our speakers. Dr. Jerry Root is Associate Professor of Evangelism and Leadership at Wheaton College, Director of the Evangelism Initiative in the Billy Graham Center. Jerry's been a member of the Wade Board since 1989 and just a good friend of all of ours here. And um, nothing gives us more pleasure than to have Jerry here. Um, Jerry's also a well-known and well-established Lewis scholar, prolific writer on Lewis, and, and he lectures worldwide, literally, and is a very sought-after speaker. Mark um, is the VP of Digital Marketing for C. Grant & Company, a firm specializing in working with higher ed, nonprofits, publishers, and other businesses. And um, Jerry and Mark have been friends for, I don't know, quite a while. And have a, a wonderful way of working through and thinking through things together. So we're going, to, we're going to benefit from that. This is the first in a series of four lectures under the general title of The Neglected Lewis, C.S. Lewis. And it's um, some of Lewis's best things are less well known. And that's what Jerry and Mark are going to help us see. And um, I have never read literary criticism as that's as interesting as what C.S. Lewis writes. So. Um, Jerry's going to uh, start us off this evening, and so let me just ask Jerry to come up. So thank you very much. Thank you, Marge. I'm really grateful to you, and I'm grateful to have the opportunity to work with Mark again. It was true we were here after the surprising imagination of C.S. Lewis came out, and it's really nice to see Julie Mitchell here because we dedicated that to her husband, Chris shortly after he passed away is also and also to her and our reason for that was because chris was one of my best friends and he was uh, one of mark's really important mentors and we both loved him deeply but anyway now it's time to turn attention to uh, something else let's pray though father I, I thank you for the privilege we have of considering some of lewis's literary critical works help us to have our hearts in flame with desire for you, connected to our minds as we think through these issues. Fill us with your spirit for this time and give each person what he or she needs in this hour. We ask this in Christ's name, amen. It's been my impression that Lewis's literary critical works are his best works, and nobody reads them. And so to talk about this this evening, in, in a sense, we're doing two things. Number one, uh, we're trying to reveal uh, out of a gratitude to Lewis, the place where his mind was forged as he thought through literary critical issues and then brought that mind to the world of Christian apologetics as well as brought his background in texts to the writing of his fiction. So that's one. Number two, it's to alert readers what great material this is so that they will in turn go on and read some of this stuff. I think they'll be surprised. I begin this lecture with a little background though. Uh, Mark and I are basically taking one of Lewis's earliest works in literary criticism, The Personal Heresy, and Mark's going to take one of his last works in literary criticism, and we're going to show that book ended, uh, basically there's a skeletal structure, while Lewis may flesh it out in different ways, similarly, he's operating from a pretty clear understanding of how we would assess a text. And part of this, again by background, is that Lewis was an objectivist. That means that Lewis believed there were knowers, subjects, and there were objects, things to be known, whether they be um, an object of uh, material value or an object of thought that one could set apart by definition and reason inferentially to some sort of conclusion. And Lewis, because he was an objectivist, some people have tried to classify him as a person infected by um, uh, rationalist uh, presuppositions, enlightenment, rationalism. 
It's not true. His objectivism goes further back to things that we might find in scripture, to things that we would find in the ancient Greeks, to things that we would find in the medieval scholastics. And Lewis's objectivist commitments he puts forth most dramatically in his book, The Abolition of Man, a book that Mortimer Adler included in the great books of the Western world in 1968. But Lewis wrote The Personal Heresy, and when he wrote The Personal Heresy, he was combating, in a sense, what he saw as subjectivistic approaches to literature, things that took a person away from the text and instead riveted attention on the author. Throughout Lewis's literary career, after he wrote The Personal Heresy, he will address these things in many other places. For example, he writes in Surprised by Joy about that tendency, and also in Experiment Criticism, the tendency to read between the lines to begin to make assessments of what the author meant when there's no text that validates this. And consequently, Lewis says the person who reads between the lines shows that he can't read the lines. Next is the doctrine of the unchanging human heart, where Lewis says there will be people who will say, well, I'm like everybody else who ever wrote. The caveman was an artist. That's not much different than I am. So consequently, then we take ourselves and project ourselves on any text thinking it's proximate to us because we understand as humans what this other human understood. Lewis said, no, the greatness of man is his elasticity of nature that he could be so different from age to age and time to time. And we want to understand each expression of this wonder of what it means to be human. Historicism is another one. Historicism is when we begin to project on history where it's going. He says, we don't know where it's going. We can say there's interesting characters, there were interesting events. But when you start to say you know where it's going and we don't know where it's going, again, attention is riveted on the interpreter. And then um, chronological snobbery was another one. We can think that because we live in this day, everybody else before us was primitives. I asked my students, how many of you think there was a time when ac academics actually believed the world was flat? 100% of them raised their hands. And I just show you, I say that shows you how provincial you are. You never read the Obed by Metamorphos. He talks about the sphere of the earth uh, 70, 80 years before the birth of Christ. Or the Timaeus by Plato. He talks about the sphere of the earth, you know, two, 300 years before Christ. We're, we're, we're just not very well read. And so consequently, we think that we're better and everybody before us was primitive. Newton said, if I've seen farther than others, it was seated on the shoulders of giants. Instead, we've got people who are saying, basically, it's amazing we got on as well as we did, given the pygmies that preceded us. And it's crazy. Psychoanalysis and literary criticism is another one. We try to psychoanalyze the author rather than dealing with the text. The author is not there. How do we psychoanalyze them? Sounds like an evening broadcast trying to decide the psychological state of the president or something like that. The anthropological approach is another example where rather than talking about the text, we try to describe how the text came to be. And he says, we're not there. And so consequently, it's usually guesses. And again, it rivets the attention on the interpreter. Um, and, and there's another uh, essay at the fringe of language at the end of Studies and Words, where Lewis says he remembered this one critic who you never knew anything about the book after you read what the critic said. All you knew was the critic's likes and dislikes. And yet the critic never explained why the likes or dislikes was merited. With this in mind, now we come to Tilliard's book. And Tilliard was a, 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 a teacher of English at Cambridge University. Later, he would become the master of Jesus College, Cambridge. He was an eminent academic. Even in his day, Lewis's career was just getting launched at this time. The two of them engaged in the debate. Uh, to Tilliard's credit, that he was willing to take time with rather a young scholar coming on it says an awful lot about Tilliard's magnanimity. But nevertheless, Tilliard had written a, 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 a book on Milton's Paradise Lost, and it came out in 1930. And in it, he said, Paradise Lost is about nothing other than the state of Milton's mind when he wrote the book. Well, Lewis took issue with this. He says, how do you make a judgment about the state of an author's mind? You don't know if your judgments are right or not because you don't have access to the author's mind. And so consequently, Lewis published an article in a work called Essays and Studies, and it was an annual journal published by the English Association at Oxford University. This essay came out in 1934. Remember, Lewis became a Christian in 1931. His first great academic book, book is The Allegory of Love. It comes out in 1936. Lewis was really a no-name guy. He publishes this article just, maybe he wrote it in 33, two years after his conversion, and, and several years before The Allegory of Love. 
And several years after, before, before the personal heresy actually comes out in 1939, he argued against Tilliard's assumptions in his work on Milton. In the 1935 journal, Tilliard responded to Lewis. In the 1936 journal, Lewis gave a rebuttal to Tilliard. And the two of them said, hey, this is kind of fun. Let's do something with it. The remarkable thing about the debate between them, I haven't ever been able to find one ad hominem in the debate. We're looking for an age where people could discuss things of difference, where they breathe light and not heat. And Lewis and Tilliard are a perfect model of that. Everybody should read it at least for that example to sort of give ourselves a mouthwash to see what a good debate looks like instead of some of the nonsense we hear today. Well, as the debate goes on, Lewis starts to make his argument as to say why it's not just about the author's mind and why there's something of merit in the text itself. As mentioned, Lewis challenges Tilliard's claim that Milton's Paradise Lost is really about the true state of the author's mind when he wrote it. For brevity, Lewis calls the approach Tilliard takes the personal heresy, caught up in the person of the author rather than caught up in what the author has to say. Lewis then begins to make his case, citing reasons why the text does not provide access to the state of the author's mind when he wrote. First, he said, when an author describes a state of emotion, the author in that, is the author in that state or removed from the state and is now looking at that state of mind by recollection. If you've read Surprised by Joy, uh, you'll know that Lewis said that he was trying to figure out the difference between um, enjoying something, experiencing it, or looking at it. He later would write an essay called Meditations in a Toolshed about this very thing. He went to a lecture at Oxford by Samuel Alexander, uh, who published the book Space, Time, and Deity. Um, if you, it's a two-volume work. I've got it. The only thing worth reading is the first chapter where uh, Alexander sets aside. The enjoyment is to be in the thing. The contemplating is to look at it. And Lewis says to Tilliard, using what he had learned way back then, if the author is writing about some emotion. He's looking at it. It's not in his mind at all. He's not experiencing it. He's writing about it. He's moved away from the experience of it. And then Lewis goes on to say, um, theater would be an example. Where, what, what, where's the mind of the author when he writes theater? Or she writes plays. You give voice to all the characters. Which one represents the author's character? It's not necessarily inside the author's mind. Lewis says, let it be granted, however, that I do approach the poet. At least I do it by sharing his consciousness, not by studying it. I look with his eyes, but not at him. So there is some place where we come together. But Lewis goes on to say, to see things as the poet sees them, I must share his consciousness and not attend to it. I must look where he looks and not turn around to face him. I must make of him not a spectacle but a pair of spectacles. That's a good one, right? Dick Geezer for an ophthalmologist. I must enjoy him and not contemplate him. Lewis then asks about the class of poetical experiences in which the consciousness that we share cannot possibly be attributed to any single individual. And here he looks at a text of scripture, the book of Isaiah. Now this is Lewis early in his Christian faith, and he seems to have a sort of higher critical view of Isaiah, thinking it might have multiple authors. We find Lewis moves away from that view, and you can find it in one of the last essays he writes, Modern uh, Theology and Biblical Criticism. But early on as a new Christian, probably in the academic world, he was familiar with higher criticism. He says, so who wrote Isaiah? If it has multiple authors, how do you say it's all about the state of the author's mind when he wrote? And this problem is exacerbated when it comes to the translation of the book of Isaiah. Whose mind is it then? The translators or the original authors and so on? Furthermore, authors engage in the use of what Lewis later called the shared imagination. It's the assumption, Mark and I talked about it last time we were here, it's the assumption that the audience matters. And if an author wants to connect with the audience, the author has to bring into recollection some shared experience that the audience has had. And then as they describe it, the audience says, oh yeah, I get that. Or the reader of the book, oh yeah, I get that. Whose mind is then at play? Lewis is writing this, this with just great logic and great sense. It's pretty remarkable. And then he goes on to say, the idea of the author is such that the author is a window into something. He writes, a poet does what no one else can do, what perhaps no other poet can do. But he does not express his personality. 
His own personality is his starting point and his limitation. It is analogous to the position of a window. If he remains at his starting point, he's no poet. As long as he is, like the rest of us, a mere personality, all is still to do. It is his business starting from his own consciousness, whatever that may happen to be, to find that arrangement of public experiences embodied in words which will admit him, and incidentally us, to a new mode of consciousness. He proceeds partly by instinct, partly by following the tradition of his predecessors, but very largely by the method of trial and error. And the result when it comes is for him, no less than for us, an acquisition, a voyage beyond the limits of his personal point of view, an annihilation of the brute fact of his own particular psychology rather than its assertion. And so Lewis goes on to say, if our attention is focused on the window, then it must be a bad window or it's not a clean one. We want to see beyond the window to what is visible beyond it. And lastly, Lewis acknowledges that many authors in his day were materialists. He, I think, suspects that maybe Tilliard leaned that way. But the materialists will tell you, as Lewis will later develop in Miracles, that the lovers are not really in love. The man sees the woman, her image is projected on the retina of the man's eye. Through a series of electrical synapses, the message is carried along the optic nerve, stimulates the brain, causes the creation of particular hormones. And he says it's love, but the materialist says, no, it's just chemistry. It's all matter. The problem is the materialist always wants you to believe, though, what he or she asserts is to be taken as truth, but it's also affected by the same circumstances. So consequently, Lewis says when the person's a materialist, if they think that the personality of the poet matters, all they've taken us to is a chemistry lab. And so this becomes problematic, too. So Tilliard responds, and he responds by seeking to define terms such as personal and personality in order to add clarity to his side of the debate. I would have to say that in reality, uh, he doesn't offer any clarity. He starts defining personality in multiple numbers of ways, which leaves the reader somewhat confused. But then Tilliard goes on to say, of course, Mr. Lewis does not confine personal to the trivial or accidental sense. He grants that it is possible through poetry to come in contact with the poet's temperament in the most intimate way. Again, seeing with his eyes rather than looking at him. The reader shares the poet's consciousness. So Tilliard here turns Lewis's words around, suggesting that Lewis is granting Tilliard's point when that hasn't been the case at all. Concerned that terms such as personal and personality ought to be properly defined, Tilliard then introduces the term normal personality. Later, he talks about remarkable personality. Later, he talks about someone whose personality impresses us, and the whole thing is a jumble. I'd like to go into more detail about this, but I need to get to the end of the book. And so while there's much back and forth here, and, and, and so on. There's something that I, 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 we need to look at, and that's when Tilliard, at the end of the second round of debate, where he moves no further um, he, in, in supporting his idea, Tilliard finally gets the place at the end of his second uh, set of comments. Well, Lewis is good about telling me what's wrong with my theory. Maybe he needs to give us his theory of poetry. He puts it like this. We have... Uh, he says, uh, whatever anyone might say about Tilliard's arguments, Lewis scholarship owes him a great debt for at the end of this one chapter, Tilliard asks, Mr. Lewis has said much about what literature is not, little about what it is. If it does not express the author's personality, should he not tell us what it does express? He has indeed dropped a few hints. I await eagerly his expansion of them. All Lewis scholarship owes a great debt to that comment because it forced Lewis then to start to write out his theory of poetry. And it was, it's fabulous. And let me sort of break it down for you. And this now is where I'll take the rest of my time. And I'll do a little more reading because some of this is complex. But I want us to get what Lewis said. Lewis begins this chapter by noting in his last essay, Dr. Tilliard is kind enough to express a hope that our controversy is gradually bringing us into agreement. In certain respects, I think it is, and even where agreement may not be possible, the grounds of disagreement are being made clearer. Before Lewis outlines his theory of poetry, he feels it's necessary to say something about the real world, the very world from which the poet draws his inspiration. He says of the real world that, 
It has a downright interestingness which meets or even besieges us daily whenever we are not ill or tired or preoccupied. In the mid-30s, so right around the time Lewis is writing this, he gives a lecture at Oxford University called um, The English Syllabus. And in this, he says to the students at Oxford University, we have fulfilled our whole duty to you if we can help you see some given tract of reality. That is, there's a world that exists independent of you, different from you, an objective reality to which you must bring your subjective understanding in alignment. Adjust the scoliosis of your mind, your will, your emotion to that objective reality. As long as you're not doing that, as long as you're focusing on the author of a text or focusing on yourself as a critic of the text, you are missing the opportunity to make those kinds of adjustments. So there's this downright interestingness. Lewis never wants an approach to poetry that would focus our attention on authors and miss this. Consequently, Lewis marks two types of symbols used in human speech, for example, one found in the world of mathematics and one in poetry. He writes, the algebraical symbol comes naked into the world of mathematics and is clothed with value by its masters. But a poetic symbol, like a rose for love and Guillaume de Lory, comes trailing clouds of glory from the real world, clouds whose shapes and color largely determine and explain its poetic use. In an equation, X and Y will do as well as A and B, but the romance of the rose could not without loss be rewritten as the romance of the onion. And if a man did not see Y, we could only send him back to the real world to study roses, onions, and love, all of them still untouched by poetry, still raw the very stuff that poetry ought to be about. Then Lewis writes that these preliminaries are important for the theory of poetry, which I am presently, presently going to propound in an answer to the challenge delivered at the end of Tilliard's essay. But Lewis has already given us, in a sense, a prequel to what's coming because he is pointing to this real world that people need to write about. Now Lewis sets forth his theory of poetry. Lewis sets forth principles regarding literary judgment, which then must be applied to specific cases. Of course, there's always a possibility the application may fall below the standard. Nevertheless, an abuse does not nullify a proper use, as Thomas Aquinas reminded us. If objective judgments can be made at all, if questions about beauty can be settled, and national parks be guarded to protect natural wonders, and museums built to preserve works of art for the pleasures of generations to come, then we should expect guiding principles might be deduced that would prove to be helpful, and these should transcend the subjective state of those who conceive the enterprise of parks and museums. There are rules the game of reason and literary judgment, just as there are rules the game of chess. Knowing the rules does not guarantee I win the game every time I sit down to play. Skill and application of the rules is necessary as well. And in light of this, Lewis does believe objective judgments are possible in matters of beauty and art because something is exhibited before the senses. It can be described and talked about as something other than a mere extension of the self. Furthermore, descriptions of the thing can develop the more the work of art is studied. The scoliosis of my judgment can be adjusted to this plumb line of reality. And this adjusted understanding can be the work of one over time, or the work of a community that adds perspective by means of a variety of perspectives and angles of vision, or it can be the work of generations revealing the enduring quality of some objects that seem to transcend time and space. So how did Lewis set forth his principles for literary judgment rooted in the texts themselves? First, Lewis defines his terms. He writes, by poetry, I mean imaginative literature, whether in prose or verse. Then he says, furthermore, the poet's materials also set him apart. Lewis says that poetry is an art or skill, and a skill is defined by its instruments. The instrument of poetry is language. Since language can be used for purposes other than poetry, uses such as philosophy, commerce, science, and so on, the poet must use language in a particular way. The skill of the poet as the skill of any artist with regard to his or her materials provides another objective basis of valuation. Did the poet use the skill well? This has nothing to do with the artist's character or intention. A craftsman may be well-intended even when his skill may be lacking. 
And furthermore, an artist with poor personal character may be brilliantly skilled. We may not like the lifestyle of the artist, but as Lewis has made clear, the judgment is not about the artist, but about the art. If the material of the poet is language, and language can be used in a variety of ways, Lewis seeks to fo focus attention on the particular ways language might be used by the artist. I hope you're seeing the precision of his thinking all the way through this so that you begin to see when he starts to turn this on defense of the faith, why his apologetics are beneficial to us because of this kind of thoughtfulness. Um, he said, if... If the material of the poet is language, and language can be used in a variety of ways, Lewis seeks to focus attention on the particular ways language might be used by the artist. The scientist, he notes, modifies language for the sake of quantification and measurement. The scientist may say the temperature is below freezing. The scientist escapes from the sensuous altogether into the world of pure quantities. The poet, on the other hand, modifies common language to enable the reader to feel the very quality of the experience. The poet may use an analogy to say what it feels like to be in weather below freezing. It feels like a slap in the face. Poetry uses its tools, extra logical elements of language, rhythm, vowel music, onomatopoeia, associations, one might add metaphors, similes, and analogy to convey the concrete reality of the experience, to bring us into it essentially. While Lewis has given some, certainly not all, basis for making some judgments regarding literary art and beauty, is the real, does the reality support the claim? Has the poet used the tools well? He seeks to prevent the false notion that ambiguity in these matters might be eliminated. Lewis writes, it is therefore not usually possible and never necessary to say of a composition in any absolute way this is poetry. What we can say is, this is further in the poetical direction than that. Then it is the burden of the critic to explain why this is so, tethering his or her observation to the text. In this regard, Lewis says, in ordinary terminology, we mean by a tall man or a rich man, one who is taller or richer than most. So by a poem, we meet a composition which communicates more of the concrete qualitative than our usual utterances do. A poet is a person who produces such compositions more often and more successfully than the rest of us. In one sense, all men and women are poets in the sense that they can and do exploit the extra logical properties of language to produce utterances of the concrete which have a value higher than zero. We do not usually call them poets, just as I'm not called a carpenter, though I could pound a nail, nor a doctor, though I know how to apply a Band-Aid. A generalization is not a thing in itself. It's an abstraction. Lewis explains, in space and time, there's no such thing as an organism. There are only animals and vegetables. There are no mere vegetables, only trees, flowers, turnips, and so forth. That there are no trees except beeches, elms, oaks, and the rest, there is no such thing as an, an elm. There is only this elm in such a year of its age. At such an hour of this day, thus lighted, this moving, thus acted on by all the past and all the present, and affording such and such experiences to me and my dog and the insect on its trunk and the man a thousand miles away who's remembering it. A real elm, in fact, can be uttered only by a poem. The sort of things we meet in poetry are the only sort we meet in life, things unique, individual, lovely, or hateful. Unfortunately, however, poetry does not, as poetry, tell us whether the particular ones she describes do in fact exist. Only science can tell you where and when you are likely to meet an elm. Only poetry can tell you what meeting an elm is like. We abstract to inquire whether God exists. Dante shows you what it would be like if he did. You, you begin to see even the flavor of Lewis's apologetics starting to come out, even in something so early as this work. Having defined poetic language and distinguished it from abstract or scientific language, Lewis notes, but language must be about something. You cannot just say, you must say this or that. To see things as different as ourselves. The critic who only speaks of his likes and dislikes of a work tells us nothing of the work itself. Without an adequate description, a reader cannot determine if the critic's likes and dislikes have merit. 
Poetry, Lewis says, is an exploitation of language to convey the concrete. The means are art. The thing conveyed, said, or uttered is not. It is everybody's business. Lewis concludes his argument by saying, at the end of the day, a good poem should have two particular qualities. First, the story must be interesting. It comes back to the word interesting again. Something other than ourself. If it's just an extension of ourself, that's not so interesting. We're already familiar with that. That is, it should arouse interest. It should awaken interest. By interesting, he means it is not projection. In fact, Lewis says, we lose ourselves, not in the poet, but in that wherein he is lost, in the adventure of Caruso, the flowing of the oxus, or the rotundity of Falstaff. He writes of that form of poetry that communicates such experiences as all men have had so that simple readers exclaim, how true. And classicists call it a just representation of general nature, just because it renders to the thing it's due. And realists say that the poet is stripping off the mask of convention and facing the facts. Classicists say just as rendering to the nature, again, which is due. As if to say, the heavens declare the glory of God and the earth reveals his handiwork. It is a wooing, demanding response. And the real of stripping off the mask, remove the pretense from man and reveal the fact of the one who stands beneath all that is clearly seen and what is made. Perhaps we can even have a hint in this comment of something Lewis will say, until we have faces. How can we meet the gods face to face until we have faces? Lewis then remarks, it is the message, not the messenger, that has my heart. This drives Lewis's theory of poetry. Nature should awaken desire, and when the poet writes well, he or she becomes a servant of a wooing God. Whether they're a believer or not, when they point to reality, as Calvin says, God dons the garment of creation, and something of God is exhibited. It is not an act of manipulation. It is an act of speaking the truth, either clearly or hiddenly, Sometimes God himself hides, but unmistakably in his power to awaken desire and set the reader in a famished quest for living bread. To see things as different than ourselves, this is the full circle Lewis' ob objectivist has come to. And that world is seen as a place where desire is awakened, not only for this world to understand it better, but for the world beyond and then he says the second thing poetry should do besides uh, arousing in us the interestingness of the thing itself, the nature of this arousal, these interesting features, Lewis says, should have a desirable permanent effect on us if possible. It should make us either happier or wiser or better. But a permanent effect, it awakens in us a desire that won't be satisfied until we connect with the permanent, the ultimate, and so on. Well, let me say a few words then about the benefit of this book. One, because of Tilliard's charge, Lewis exhibited this very early expression of what he felt poetry was, what he felt literary criticism should be. It's one of the earliest expressions in his writings. And it's wonderful. You read it, it takes your breath away, the things that he wrote. I can't do it justice. Uh, second, the book is of value because it shows us what, again, a good debate between two brilliant people can be like when it breeds light and not heat. And I think, thirdly, it's important because uh, there is one author um, who wrote a book. Um, his name was Australian scholar A.J.A. A. Waldock. He wrote a book on Paradise Lost and its critics. And he basically makes most of the book the discussion of this debate. He's pretty convinced Lewis won the debate. But he said what Lewis failed to do was ever give us a literary critical exposition of Paradise Lost. So Milton had done it. Milton went into the lion's cage. It was time for Lewis to do it. And in some senses, we have the benefit then, too, that Lewis actually goes in and produces for us, out of this debate, I think, his own A Preface to Paradise Lost. Well, anyway, that's, that's it for a personal heresy. I hope you all go read it. You can see my copy is falling apart. <laughs> anyway, blessings. <laughs>
Well, the second uh, work of literary criticism that we want to take a look at is Lewis's book, An Experiment in Criticism. And just to give you kind of a brief overview of what this book is about, um, Lewis was really trying to turn the dominant criticism of the day, which was an evaluative criticism, on its head. An evaluative criticism is usually employed in judging the content of books. And Lewis wanted to try to see how far it would be possible to judge books by how they were read, to, to, to judge a good book by the way in which it was read, and to judge a bad book by the way in which it was read. And I just want to clarify here that um, I think in this book, Lewis is primarily speaking about works of imaginative literature, not nonfiction. And so as he starts to develop his argument, uh, Lewis uh, enumerates two categories of readers. He talks about the group of the many, which he calls the unliterary, and the group of the few, which he calls the literary. And I want to take a quick look at how these two different groups read. And we'll start with the group of the few, which is the, the literary group. The group of the few um, read a work multiple times. They find something there that's enchanting to them. They'll return to it again and again. And they have a desire for the leisure and the silence in which to do this. Reading changes their consciousness. And, and, and they, they enjoy thinking about what they're reading, and they enjoy talking about it with others. The many, on the other hand, the unliterary, never tend to read anything twice. Reading isn't valued in the same way as it is for the group of the literary. And these folks aren't changed by what they read, and they don't want to necessarily think about it or communicate about it with others. And Lewis says, they tend not to read anything that isn't narrative with some sort of, of action or main event. And they demand a swift moving narrative. And he says they don't have any ears. They read primarily with their eyes. So they tend to miss the artistry that the author is presenting. And they're unconscious of the style. And we'll return to that a little bit later on. And Lewis says uh, these folks could come across a, a phrase like, like this, like the relation between mechanization and nationalization. And he says they, would, they wouldn't turn a hair when they read that. But someone in the group of the literary would see the alliteration within that phrase. They'd see the beauty and in the, in the rhyme scheme and so forth. Um, I think you know, Lewis is, is very careful um, to clarify what he means by these two distinctions, these two groups. And so he, he want, he, he, he's very careful to say that we must not equate the group of the many with the rabble and, and somehow imply a moral judgment on this group for the ways in which they read. And, and I think maybe Lewis's choice of words, the many and the few, the literary and the unliterary, is, is a little unfortunate because it sounds like there's some exclusiveness going on there. But actually, that's not the case. And Lewis will come back to this again and again throughout the work to make sure that we understand that there's no moral judgment implied in the way these people read. It's just not the, the, the ideal way that Lewis would have us read a work. And Lewis says that this, this idea that he puts forth of reading can hold true for other arts and, and for beauty as well. He says that people can move between the two groups. So someone who's, who's a, a part of the few when it comes to literature um, may be part of the many when it comes to uh, painting or music and so forth. People can move back and forth. These aren't inflexible groups. So I want to take a little bit of a closer look at how these two groups read. So we'll take a look at what, what is involved in poor reading um, for the group of the many, the unliterary, as Lewis calls them. Lewis says that they lack a certain amount of appreciation for what they read, and they use the art for their own ends. If it can't be used in some way, it tends to be meaningless to them. They can't do something with it. It's meaningless. And Lewis says, this isn't a bad rate to read. It's just not a full experience of reading. And the full experience to Lewis was, was very important. And again, we'll return to that a little bit later, what it means to have that full response to literature. Because he says it's the presence of that full response that separates the group of the many from the few. Uh, for the group of the many, everything must be easily recognizable as they read. They don't want to do a whole lot of work with their imagination. Um, 
and, and to that end, things like cliche are vital because cliches keep things easily recognizable. And Lewis says they want words to act as hieroglyphs. And a hieroglyph is, is, is just something that releases a stereotyped reaction. So if I say, her blood ran cold, you'll understand that as a hieroglyph for fear. So it makes reading much easier. There are also a number of mindsets that destroy appreciation and lead to poor reading. Lewis says that those who work in, in the fields of literary criticism, who are, are critics or reviewers of books, can just through simple overwork lose their appreciation of texts. In the same way, scholars who work for a university who have to publish or perish, as it were, can also lose their appreciation. Then there's the reader as status seeker, the person that's swayed by the trends, the approved works. Um, you know, I, I think of the New York Times bestseller list. That's, there's nothing wrong with that list, and there's a lot of good works that have come out of it, but it's the approved list, right? And so Lewis says, in a household, where this sort of mindset is, is kind of held in sway, um, the only real literary experience that, that's happening there could be the, the little boy in the back upstairs bedroom who's reading Treasure Island under the covers at night with a flashlight. <laughs> then there's the devotee of culture, the person that reads to improve themselves. Again, this is not a, a bad thing. Lewis says his motivations may be good, but he might not actually be a true lover of literature. Another mindset that destroys appreciation are those who are part of the vigilant school of critics. These are the folks who are the arbiters of what's good to read. They're the folks who are deciding what's to be in the literary canon. I think of uh, folks like Mortimer Adler in his book, How to Read a Book, or Harold Bloom in his book, How to Read and Why. There's also the idea of reading as a meritorious activity. And I think that can be often part of our upbringing. We're, we're taught to, to believe that works of literature are good for us and we should read them. And this can lead to a, a sort of checklist mentality. And I certainly possessed that checklist mentality for a long time. And I think in, in some ways I still do. Um, if I read a book, I felt very smug about it. I checked it off my list. And, and, and I guess in, in retrospect, I, I really had very little idea at the time of what I was reading. And when I was uh, here at Wheaton College, um, I had an English class with Dr. Jacobs, who's now at Baylor University. And it happened to be a senior seminar class, and the subject of the class was on reading. And he said something I'll never forget. He said, read at whim. Read at whim. And, and Jacobs was a great proponent of Lewis's ideas of what constitutes good reading. And he advocates for pleasure and joy. And Jacobs writes this in his book, The Pleasures of Reading in an Age of Distraction. And if you haven't read that book, I'd, I'd recommend you run out and get it. It's fabulous. I mean, to give you a little context for this quote, um, Jacobs had received a number of requests from uh, former students and other folks asking, what books should I read? What are the books that I should be uh, aware of? And can you give me a list of things to read? And here's what he says. So this is what I say to my petitioners. For heaven's sake, don't turn reading into the intellectual equivalent of eating organic greens, <laughs> or shifting the metaphor slightly, some fearfully disciplined appointment with an elliptical trainer of the mind, in which you count words or pages the way some people fix their attention on the calories burned readout. Some assiduous and taxing exercise that allows you to look back on your conquest of Middlemarch with grim satisfaction. <laughs> How depressing. This kind of thing is not reading at all, but what C.S. Lewis called social and ethical hygiene. And his reference to Lewis's quote there is taken from experiment and criticism. So all of these things are deterrents to appreciation and receptiveness and lead to poor reading. So this leads us into what good reading means for the group of the few or the literary. How do the few have that full literary experience that Lewis um, is so intent that we should understand? Well, when the full read, they read a work um, and, and they accept it. They, they accept the work for itself, not for what it can do for them or to them or for what they can do with it. 
They're absorbed as they read. They read wholeheartedly. And there's a loss of the self. Um, Lewis describes elsewhere, I think it's in Selected Literary Essays, about two activities of the imagination. He talks about the free activity, and he talks about the servile activity of the imagination. And the free activity loves the thing imagined for itself. The self is not at the center of the story. The servile activity, on the other hand, um, is, is, is projective. The self is at the center. It's the hero of the story. So Lewis says that those in the group of the few as they read have this uh, free activity of the imagination come into play. They read in the same spirit that the author wrote. And their minds are laid open without preconception. They don't bring their worldviews to bear on the text and so read into it things that are not there. And he says they need a minimum amount of detail. Their imaginations will fill in the rest. He says they have the obedient imagination or the fertile imagination which builds in a moment on the bare facts. And he likens this, this real appreciation to a sort of negative, positive process. On the negative side is the stripping out of subjectivity, the laying aside of preconceptions of interests and associations. And there's that surrender, that removal of the self. On the positive side, we look to see what is there. And we wait for something to be done to us. We receive what the author has to give to us. And Lewis says that the many use literature and the few receive it. Another element uh, that's valued by the, the group of the few or the literary um, are stories with what Lewis calls an extra literary quality. These are uh, qualities that have an effect on us that's unique. And he calls this effect myth. Now, this doesn't have to refer to uh, traditional myths as we know them, the, the Greek, the Roman, the Norse myths. Um, they could, but again, um, we may read these and not have the mythic response that Lewis is talking about. So this idea of myth can show up in, in other stories besides what we think of as traditional myth. And the elements of this extra literary quality are that the story strikes deep, and it strikes deep independent of the telling. So we can come across it in multiple formats or genres and will still affect us in the same way. It has a, a sense of inevitability about it. Lewis says that it, that it acts as a permanent object of contemplation. And I can think back to even my own um, reading. There are certain images, certain um, just, uh, yeah, just pieces of reading that, that, that recur to my mind regularly and, 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 and I have that mythic response. And, and they continue to feed me after years after I've read them. Human sympathy is at a minimum. We don't project ourselves into it. Again, we use the free activity of the imagination. These uh, extra literary quality stories also deal with the fantastic, primarily with impossibles and preternaturals, and the experience of reading them is often grave and awe-inspiring. And Lewis says, we give to these stories the lasting allegiance of the imagination. And this again ties into that object, the, uh, back into the idea of that permanent object of reflection. So the extra literary effect is important. There's yet another way that the group of the few read <clears throat> And uh, they look at a work of art as two separate things, <clears throat> as a thing said and as a thing made. And for Lewis, the thing said is what he calls the logos. It's the meaning, it's the events, it's the plots, it's the opinions and emotions that we come across in any given work. Then there's the poema or the thing made. Uh, it's the isness of the thing. It, it, it involves the principles of design. We think of contrast, of balance, of shape. Lewis says it's the organizations of words producing a patterned experience. And he says that criticism becomes one-sided when it focuses just on the logos, on the thing said. And that gets back to that idea of evaluative criticism that we talked about at the beginning. Lewis Seltzware says that the man that uh, writes the love sonnet not only loves the beloved, but he loves the sonnet. 
And so it's again that idea of the thing made and the thing said, we have to look at both. And Lewis says that this one-sided approach is like criticizing the lens after looking at it rather than through it. And we have to do both. Again, Jerry, you talked about this a little bit, the idea of looking at a thing two ways. And you referenced uh, that essay that Lewis wrote called Meditation in a Tool Shed, <coughs> and in which Lewis is standing in a dark shed and he sees a beam of sunlight coming through and he realizes he can look at the beam or he can crouch down and he can look along that beam. And as he looks along it, he can see the leaves outside waving in the breeze and he can see the sun in the distance. So again, we have to look at it both ways. And Lewis says the problem with this one-sided criticism is that we focus on what we can pull out of it and don't give the work a chance to work on us. Thus, we end up seeing only ourselves. And he says this, one of the chief operations of art is to remove our gaze from that mirrored face to deliver us from that solitude. Well, of course, Lewis being Lewis, uh, distinctions must be made whenever there are words or ideas that, that can be misconstrued. And there are a couple of those here. Um, I mentioned earlier this idea of the extra literary effect that's important to the group of the few as they read. Um, and and I, I mentioned that one of the, the things that's important in that is that the stories deal often with what's fantastic in literature. And so Lewis wants us to uh, make sure that we understand what fantasy means. And Lewis uh, defines it simply as, as uh, those things that deal with preternaturals or impossibles, things that are beyond the normal and the natural. But he says we can also bring psychological definitions to our understanding of fantasy. One of these, he says, is what he calls normal castle building. And normal castle building can kind of be broken down into two strands. Uh, uh, one of them is the disinterested or free type of imagination I talked about. And the second is the egoistic or the servile type of imagination that I talked about earlier, where the self is at the center of the thing imagined. And Lewis says the more one reads as an egoistic castle builder, the more a superficial realism will be demanded, and the less the fantastic is liked. So now Lewis wants to make sure we understand what the word realism means in this context. And he says there's two types of realism. First of all, there's realism of presentation. And realism of presentation brings something close to us. It makes it palpable and, and vivid. It's sharply imagined detail. And it utilizes our five senses. and it often, often requires a suspension of disbelief. Realism of content, on the other hand, is probable or true to life. Uh, there aren't many details, and it doesn't require a suspension of belief, of disbelief, I'm sorry. And, and Lewis says that most literature up until the present time was of the fantastic variety. It was only the exceptional that merited a story. And, and similarly, if we think of, of our conversations with people, we tell the stories of the things that are exceptional, of the one that got away. We, and, and I think that gives us a good sense of, of how we understand story, our attitude towards stories. Of course, there are a number of arguments against fantasy and fairy tales, uh, a romance, um, a, a these different uh, genres. And, and one of them is that they deceive and that they're often uh, thought to be escapist literature, and this often coincides with the charge of childishness. And Lewis says all reading is an escape, but the point is, what is it an escape to? It can either be an escape to egoistic castle building where we're uh, projecting ourselves into the narrative and we're the center of that story, or it can be disinterested castle building where the thing is, is imagined is loved for itself. Lewis says the taste for fantasy is normal, but it's atrophied in adults. And he says there are certain traits of childhood we would be fools not to want to keep. And so we have to understand escapism rightly. And we must not uh, engage in chronological snobbery, as, as Jerry mentioned earlier, to look at the past and denigrate the ways in which things were done. 
Well, just as the many or the group of the unliterary can misread, so too the group of the few or the literary can misread. And Lewis says that both groups um, can confuse art and life. And art is made up of the stuff of life. It's, it's selected, it's isolated, it's picked from life uh, to be used by the artist for his own ends. So we can't therefore fall into the trap of confusing art with life, yet we tend to do that. Our culture tells us many stories through film, through books and other arts, and they, they become a lie that we believe. And we begin behaving as, this, as if this is how life ought to really be. And we expect it. This doesn't make it real and I think leads to ultimate dissatisfaction and unhappiness. So in reading, it's important that we don't fixate on the psychological truths that we can pull out of works. We have to realize that any reflections we make on a work come from us and not the artist. So what is it about this full experience of reading that's so important? Lewis says that we have to enter fully into the attitudes and opinions and experiences of other men rather than being concerned with altering our own opinions. And we have to understand the context in which we're reading to read more accurately. And he writes this in Preface to Paradise Lost. To enjoy our full humanity, we ought, so far as is possible, to contain within us potentially at all times and on occasion to actualize all the modes of feeling and thinking through which man has passed. You must, so far as in you lies, become an Achaean chief while reading Homer, a medieval knight while reading Mallory, and an 18th century Londoner while reading Johnson. Only then will you be able to judge the work in the same spirit that its author writ and to avoid chimerical criticism. And this theme surfaces again and again in Lewis. He writes about it in selected literary essays, in the studies in, in medieval and Renaissance literature, in his essay on stories. And he beseeches us to receive the work, to let it work upon us and to let ourselves experience the mood of the story without trying to get anything from it. And in studies in medieval and Renaissance literature, he writes this, we want to know, therefore, as far as may be, we want to live through for ourselves the experience of men long dead. What a poem may mean to moderns and to them only, however delightful, is from this point of view merely a stain on the lens. We must clean the lens and remove the stain so that the real past can be seen better. And I think this helps us to approach the work as Lewis would have us without preconceptions, without bringing our worldview to bear on the text and so reading into it things that are not there. So what is it about Lewis's plan for reading and, and doing criticism in this way that makes sense? Well, he says it fixes our attention on the reading um, instead of the content of the book. It puts our feet on solid ground. We can observe how people read, we can talk to them. We can, we can have conversation on how they read. And he says it helps to banish our social and intellectual snobbery. Again, coming back to that point I made at the beginning, that we can't imply any kind of a moral judgment on how people read. And it leaves us with an uncertainty about how someone reads. So if I look at someone here and I say, hey, you're reading a piece of trash, I can't actually do that because maybe you're having that mythic response to that piece of literature. And so Lewis says we have to be very careful when we do that. As critics, we shouldn't push our evaluations on other, others, but we really should be describing the character of the book. And it's this evaluative criticism that Lewis has been taking to task in this book, and he thinks that this has caused the most harm to the kind of reading that he advocates. So we've looked at the rationale for why we should read by Lewis's plan. We've kind of looked at the two different groups, the group of the many and the few, and how they read. So what is all this uh, in the service of? Why is this so important to Lewis? And what is the importance of this book for us? Well, Lewis writes in his essay on stories um, that all our life is composed of successive moments. Something happens and then something else happens. 
and, and, and perhaps we're searching for some um, idealized uh, way of experiencing life, but uh, Lewis says, then another moment happens. And um, we're always looking for the next thing. We're always, we're always thinking, if I could just get here, then I will have arrived. If she would marry me, then I will have arrived. If he would love me, if I could just have this job, if I could just make this money, then I will finally have arrived. Then I will feel this way. And Lewis says, in a lifetime of, of successive moments, we are always searching for something that is non-successive, where we will have finally arrived. And he writes this in The Weight of Glory. We want something more. We want to enter into the beauty we see to become one with it, to pass into it. At present, we are on the wrong side of the door. This is why we create myths and stories and people the air, earth and water with gods and goddesses and nymphs and elves. And he says all the leaves of the New Testament are rustling with the rumor that one day, God willing, we will get in. And Lewis says sometimes, an experience of reading stories in this way that he describes gets us close to that experience of the non-successive. Lewis also wants us to have an experience of primary literary experience, what, what the kind of reading that he's been describing. And he says this is vital to our culture. And he says this evaluative criticism has all but destroyed this type of reading. And the individual response has become very rare. Lewis calls it dangerous, and of course, um, he suggests the treatment of banning all evaluative criticism. Um, but we live in an age, I think, that, that tends not to value reading, where the proliferation of, of digital technologies have really kind of nearly eradicated an interest in reading um, or even a need for it, where we're told what to think and we just, we go ahead and follow along and we lose that individual response that Lewis is talking about. So reading this way must give us something unique, something that we can't get anywhere else. So what is the point? Why should we read this way? Why does Lewis say this is vital to our culture? He says we need to listen to other voices because we do not contain all knowledge and experience. And I'm gonna steal a, a little uh, illustration from Jerry. In the Library of Congress, there's 16 million books. Who's read them all? Even on doing a search on Google, Google has indexed 30 trillion pages. Who's visited them all? Buswell Library across the street has 400,000 volumes. Who's read them all? Think of the, the library in your own house. How many of the books on your own shelves have you read? We're absolute pea brains. We, we need others' eyes. And Lewis says we seek an enlargement of our being. We want to be more than ourselves. He says we demand windows, things that will get us out of ourselves. And, and this helps to correct provincialism. It helps to heal our loneliness. And we can engage in, in, in our disinterested fantasies um, and use that free activity of the imagination. But I think ultimately we realize that they're just saturated with our own psychology. And so Lewis says we need other eyes. And at the end of this book, he says, I, um, he says, um, my own eyes are not enough for me. I would see what others have imagined. Even that's not enough. I would see what others have written. Even that's not enough. I regret that the brutes cannot write books. Gladly would I see how reality is presented to the eye of a mouse or a bee, or how it comes charged to the olfactory sense of a dog. There's a certain sense in which we live in a narrow prison of the self, and we need others' eyes. When a culture that values information over wisdom Activity and busyness and digital noise over silence and contemplation, where information is valued more than transformation. Our windows have become darkened. Or worse yet, we, never, we, we don't even care to look out of those windows, or we don't even realize that there are windows there to look out of. The author and social critic Sven Burkertz says that contemplation is the point of thinking. This requires solitude, what he calls time as duration, and lingering among intimations and suppositions. 
These are seemingly lost skills. I mean, it sounds like I'm talking about something very archaic here. But these are necessary to Lewis's way of reading fully. And without these characteristics that reading provides, we fall back into self-referentialism. We see the world through our own eyes. And Lewis says, instead of looking out of the prison bars, we sink back onto the straw in the darkest corner. And G.K. Chesterton writes in his book, The Napoleon of Notting Hill, that there is a law written in the darkest of the books of life, and it is this. If you look at a thing 999 times, you are perfectly safe. If you look at it for the thousandth time, you are in frightful danger of seeing it for the first time. And so that's what others can give us. They can help to give us this thousandth look where we finally see beyond ourselves, where the windows are open, the light streams in. We get up off the straw in the corner and look out the window, and our view of the world expands. I think we'll stop there. Thank you. Well, thank you both, Jerry and Mark, for really such, I mean, those are tremendous works and little known, and you've given us great, I hope, inspiration to read them, as well as to read a little differently and read other things. Um, just want to rem uh, let you know that It'll be the first Tuesday, I think it's December 5th and December, when the next series in this lecture will be given by Jerry and Mark. And um, for those of you who remember our, our Hanson Lectureship series, this year it's on um, Dorothy Sayers, Christine Cologne will be giving it, and that will be next Thursday night here at, but it's 7 p.m., not 7.30. So just check our website for that. And. Um, we have time, I think, for just a couple questions, not too many, and um, we'll pass the mic. So, um, Jerry and Mark, if you want to come back. Mark. <coughs> Excuse me. Thanks so much. Um, a question for both of you, but uh, related to Mark's talk. Um, are we born the few or the many? Uh, let's suppose that for the first time I read this, I wanted to be one of the few. And uh, and I've been working at it for you know 20 years now. And most of the time when I read, I'm just bored. And uh, I keep reading for one reason, and that's to become the few. Is that just a sure sign that I'm hopeless? Uh, and that, that, that this wanting to be part of the few is, is just one yet a species of the many, uh, and that I'm trying to better myself. But in, in all seriousness, I mean, I mean this seriously, because it's a live concern for me. Um, am I out of luck, or can we learn? Uh, we can't flip, flip a switch, but through a certain kind of practice, can we uh, become the few? Well, I, I think there are some people where you see they have a proclivity for the love of literature early on. I think there are others who do acquire it. I, I, when I went to college, I'd read six books before I went to college, not counting comic books. <laughs> and yet I acquired a love. My sister told me about C.S. Lewis, and I said, come on, there are books like this. And I haven't been able to put books down ever since. So I think you can learn these things. But the key is, uh, I, I, you were asking the question, I think you were asking it hypothetically, because you are a lover of books. I've heard you give a talk, an informal talk on Nietzsche. You studied Nietzsche for your doctoral work. And when you started talking about that stuff, you didn't point your finger at us and shake your finger. You instead got shoulder to shoulder with us and you started talking about this thing. I said, come on, I gotta go reread Nietzsche. So you, you had a love of that literature and you had a grasp of it and you've seen wider applications of it. No, you are one of the, the few. But like Mark had said earlier, you could be one of the few in one area and not one of the few in another area. And so there's always room to stretch and grow, but maybe if we've looked at the book for the thousandth time, maybe all of a sudden we can start catching it. My guess is if you start catching it in some areas, it'll be easier to catch it in others. Is that fair? Yeah.
Yeah, and I would say, I think um, I mentioned this in the talk, that the idea that you know you can move back and forth between the, the groups and someone who's in the group of the many, um, for whatever reason, can suddenly develop an appreciation for literature. I, similar to Jerry, I had, you know, when I went to Wheaton, and I went a, li a little bit as an older student, I was 24 when I came here, and I had not really a very great appreciation for literature. Um, and I developed that while I was here, so it's definitely possible. Is that helpful, Mark? Yeah, thanks. All right. <laughs> huh? <laughs> it's great hope. The academic is always at risk yes. because the books that caused him or her to first fall in love with their subject can become the tools and they get regulated to the toolbox and we, we, we don't love them anymore. And I, that's unfortunate. And I, I, in my own life, when I graduated from college, somebody said, you don't get an education in college you just lay a foundation for one. Commencement means you'll now build on that foundation. Pick an author who will take you places and make him your life's author. It could be a composer, it could be an artist, it could be a period of history, a country. I pick Lewis. And, and this summer, I crossed the oceans for the 132nd time. And I don't think I've paid for a trip overseas for 15 years, because people have asked me to come lecture on these things. If nobody was interested, Nobody at all was interested. And I never heard from anybody ever again, could you come do something on Lewis? I'd still be all in. I'd be all in. I feel like a boy who saw a beetle on a leaf in the back garden when he was young. And he first was noticing the sheen of the sunlight <coughs> glistening off the blue, the blue uh, green um, wings. And was so fascinated, went to the library and finally found that beetle. And then started t studying about its habitat and its, its, uh, all of its uh, life cycles and all this other stuff and constellating subjects around that. And one day found out everybody wanted to find out about his beetle. Lewis is my beetle. And if nobody was interested, I'd still be all in. And it's not just Lewis. He opens more than wardrobe doors. You start reading the other books that he refers to and constantly your breath is taking away and you can't get enough. And there have been books that Lewis referred to that I've read over and over again just because of the sheer joy of reading it. And it takes my breath away. And I think that's available for anybody. Anyway. Yeah, Matthew. We've got Matthew and Mark as Luke and John. Are they yeah, here? yeah. Well, uh, Thank you so much, guys, on both of you. Um, I, I'm not sure my question is entirely uh, formulated in my mind, but I'm wondering about what about reading people who aren't concerned about finding objective reality? How do you read works where there are pure subjectivists and, and again, they're not pursuing this? What, what, what might Lewis say to that? Do we, do we disregard those sorts of readings? Do we, do we call them out on that? Or does, does that make sense? Well, there's a, this, this chapter, it's called at the fringe of language. It's the last chapter in uh, Studies and Words. Lewis talks about this literary critic. And he said, I, I started reading him. He, he didn't write critique about my friend's books, but I started reading him because all of a sudden I saw that every time he wrote, I learned nothing about the book. I learned everything about him. And he said, he riveted my attention to himself. And Lewis says, I was curious what would make a person be like this. So we can sometimes look at things that we would say are pretty self-referential or something like that. And, and we, can, uh, we can be fascinated. What does that tell me about not only what humans can be like and do? Are these things present in my life? Am I doing these places? But I've become blind to it, awakened over here with this critic. I now begin to see something in myself I hadn't seen before. And I begin to see then beyond that how I might be hurting other people in my world I didn't realize before. There's all kinds of great things you can get out of any human endeavor, I would think. Yeah. Um, I would say one other thing about the personal heresy. I think there's at least 10 of Lewis's other books anticipated 
and what he wrote about in that book. At least 10, I'd go through it and I, 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 in my lecture notes, I marked them out in red and put the notes there, but I didn't bring attention to it. Yes, first name? Debbie. Debbie. I don't really have a question. Yeah, well, when, okay. when Matt said, I don't know if this question's purely formulated in my mind, we, Mark and I wouldn't give answers purely formulated in our minds either. Well, I, what you said about making, making judgment on the things that other people read, it just reminded me of um, Ayan Hirsi Ali. I don't know if you're familiar with her. She's a Somalian woman. She wrote Infidel a few years ago, but she said that, you know, how women are treated in those countries are, they are very limited. And she said what really awoke many of the women there, somehow they, they um, were able to get, or, or someone gave to their village these trashy romance novels. <laughs> and it just, it changed their lives about how they could think about themselves. I thought that was pretty amazing, you know, we, because we do kind of put judgments, I think, a little bit on what people read. But I thought that was really interesting, and I appreciated what you said about that. Lewis said that his boys were reading comic books. Yeah. And he said, if that awakens them to a love of literature, then praise God for comic books. You know, we, we don't want to be saying it's only this kind of thing that can awaken this interest. It, the awakening is an interesting thing in its, its own life. I think something supernatural is involved in the transaction. So, yeah. Je, um, To refer to G.K. Chesterton again, um, he wrote an essay called uh, A Defense of Penny Dreadfuls, and Penny Dreadfuls uh, were sort of the, the boys' serial literature of uh -huh. the 19th century, considered to be very low. And, and he says this, the simple need for some kind of ideal world in which fictitious persons play an unhampered part is infinitely deeper and older than the rules of good art and much more important. So. That was great. <laughs> I anticipated that question. <laughs> Did he pay you to ask the question? <laughs> For the penny. Okay. Thank you. Oh, yeah. oh I'm sorry, Chris. Um, <clears throat> thank you for everything you've said about reading and awakening the, uh, the joy of reading. But I guess a question I would have for both of you would be, how do we keep um, technology from becoming the numinous itself rather than, you know, what is written or what is, you know, what the author is expressing? It seems that today the, the glitz of, of and speed of technology can become the very thing itself that steals away the imagination. And in fact, I find young people not needing to imagine because so many things have been imagined for them. So how do you think Lewis would suggest that we guard against that? Well, I know he wouldn't be using much technology. I'm pretty confident of that. But I think that probably we have to teach temperance to people. And temperance was always a means to a greater good. And people, I think, have lost sight of the greater good. If you can help people see the greater good, then the lesser goods begin to become less interesting and important. The, in technology, a lot of times, too, it does become more about me. I can isolate myself. So here, when Lewis is saying, even in the personal heresy, that the poet should be writing about the world that is interesting, something other than myself, and if it awakens desire, and then he says also awakens desire by that interesting thing of things of more permanent value. So here's the awakening of the longing ultimately for, for uh, ultimate things, ultimately for God, I think. So you put first things first, you get second things thrown in. Technology isn't necessarily bad. Lewis is not a dualist. But, but all things are corruptible in a fallen world. So how do I avoid the corruption and I think it's going to have to be learning the greater good and then learning the temperance about things that could risk distracting me from the greater good. Is that fair? Yeah, yeah. Um, this is something I actually think a lot about. Um, Aren't you doing a book on this? Right I now? am doing a book on this, yeah. But it's on hold for the moment, which I'll, and I'll tell you the reason for that. Um, 
But yeah, I think a lot about this. Um, we have to walk a fine line with technology because it's the way the world works right now. Um, and so we can't avoid it. We can't say we shouldn't use it. We have to, at some degree, uh, some level, we have to accept it and be okay with it. But I think the temperance thing is important and, and, and is important. And my wife and I, who's here tonight, uh, just had a baby daughter five weeks ago. And um, I think about this a lot. How am I going to raise my daughter as a lover of literature, as a lover, a lover of, of books, and reading and reading books as, as paper books, not uh, on the digital device? Um, how am I going to teach her to function in this world, but still to love this sort of thing? It's going to be a hard thing, I think. Yeah. Um, but so it's, it's something I think about a lot, and I don't necessarily have an answer yet. Write about it when you do. I'll write about it. <laughs> Can Mark. we take one more question? One, one final more? One final question? One final question. Oh. You guys. Oh. There's time. You're back Sorry. This is a, a, an extension on the last question that was asked. I saw a stat recently that said that reading, the amount that we read is actually up because of technology. How do you find the voices? How do you find the folks? who are writing the things? How do you find the artist? Did Lewis offer any guidance about how to find those voices in the din? I, you know, I don't know exactly. But I know with technology, we may be reading more because we could download books and we can take them with us on a plane or as we commute on a bus or a train to Chicago and back and so on. I can't read those books. I, I got a a Kindle when they first came out, and after a while I marked it all up, I couldn't see anything through the screen anymore. <laughs> I, I can't read without marking, and interrelating, and debating with the author, and disagreeing, or seeing further application. Mortimer Adler, you mentioned him, his how to read a book, says your margins should all be marked up, you should have conversation. I don't see that conversation going on. I see people reading, they're becoming familiar. And then you say, hey, I saw you reading this book six months ago. I, I wanted to ask you a question about that book. Oh, I don't even remember reading it. That's what I see. So they're not, they're not entering into the world of the book. They're not experiencing the book uh, as robustly as I would hope, because it's just something in one ear and out the other ear, like a bad sermon or something. So. Is that, is that fair? I don't know. Maybe you have something else. Yeah, I, I would just refer back to, um, again, when I was here at Wheaton, I had a professor, Ellen Jacobs, who said, read at whim. And as we read at whim uh, those things that interest us, those things that catch our attention, we find those things that, um, in, 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 as Lewis described, that give us that full literary experience, that give us that mythic response. And I don't think there's any right or wrong or there's any approved list that, that, that we can give you, but it's just, uh, I think, it's experimentation. It's it's reading widely and finding uh, what what uh, connects with you. And, and, and when the when you see the people reading these, or you read the statistic, did they say anything after that? What happens to the people that have read the book? Mortimer Adler once said the best way to get an education is to travel, because you go and you say, "Well, they do it differently here than we did at home," and you start asking questions that you would have never asked, and you grow. But he said the second best way to get an education is to read great books and discuss them with others. Because my own eyes are not enough for me. I would see what others have seen. I would understand what they've written. Have I entered into it to the degree where I say, you know, I, I, I want to talk about this with somebody. And I, I, don't, I don't see the discussions so much. I think people are hungry for it. I, I go out witnessing with college students every once in a while. I've never found it easier in my life I've been doing this all my, since, since I came to faith, all my life, talking to people about Jesus. I've never found it easier to talk to people about Christ because people are so hungry to talk about what's going on inside of them and their spiritual quests and so on. I'm not, I, I, maybe, maybe the books are producing that result. I don't know. But I, I'm not convinced that we're talking about things as much that would make us maybe more inclined to get the benefits of something interesting of permanent value of the book. Well, thank you, Jerry, Mark, 
um, hopefully it inspired us all to do more reading and um, just one comment I'd make just having you know being around children grandchildren I think reading aloud is a wonderful way most people like being read to and also if they see you know my grandson now is about he's nine and he's he's learned to read because we we kind of keep doing that and you know I'll sit and read with him now he wants to read to himself but he wants to read with me so you know there are ways to kind of catch that some kids just you know they're they're pretty much born with a book you know um, but not everyone and um, we also I just invite you our world gets noisy and busy and whatever we have an absolutely beautiful reading room down the hall it's open to you when we're here we'd love to have you you we do ask that you read something that we have here not just bring things in <laughs> just because we wouldn't have enough seats but we would love to have you come tell us hey I'd like to know about Lewis in prayer or I'd, I'd like a good story or this and that and that's um, Elaine who's here is one of the archivists in our reading room we're we're delighted we want to share what we have here we'd love to have you back also, what's the date of Family Weekend here? Do you remember? Um, November 3rd and 4th. No, November 3rd and 4th, that Friday and that Saturday at, do you remember the times? 2 o'clock on Friday and 11 o'clock on Saturday. 2 o'clock on Friday and 11 o'clock on Saturday. There's going to be story time here for children. Of course, adults are welcome with them. Be, I think, in our museum area? Yeah. And, you know, just so if you, if you, you can look on our website to get the information or give a call. Um, we're always trying to do things to encourage children, to encourage all ages. So, you know, leave here and read and read some more of the literary criticism. Come back next week to hear more about Dorothy Sayers and early December, Jerry and Marco back again. So thank you both so much and good night. Thank you.